Hi there. In the previous video, I spent some time explaining some metrics. In particular, I derived the precision score, the recall score, as well as the F1 score. And I even shared some code that allows you to reconstruct all of these metrics yourself from scratch. I did hint, however, that all of these metrics are in some way related in an interesting way. And that is something that I would like to expand upon in this video. But in order to show this interesting relationship, I'm going to have to explain an experiment first. Let's say that you've got a machine learning model inside a scikit-learn. And let us also assume it's a model for classification. Then in order to learn from data, you would typically call this fit method. And after that, you would call this predict method. However, a lot of the time, depending on the model, you will also have access to this predict underscore proba method, where this predict method usually gives you just the classes itself. This proba method gives you some sort of a quote unquote probability. I'm putting probability in quotes here because it's not actual probability theory that's happening here under the hood, but you do get some sort of a number that's between zero and one and every row sums up to one in a way that you can at least interpret this as some form of a certainty, so to say. But the reason I bring this up is because predict proba and predict are related in a way. Let's say that I've got this array of proba values going out. Note, both of these two values sum up to one. But then in the base setting, if there are just two classes, the prediction is going to be defined by a threshold. If this column belongs to class zero and if this column belongs to class one, then the class with the highest probability value will be picked. And because every row has to sum up to one, effectively that boils down to whenever there's a proba value larger than 0.5, then we are going to use that to determine the class. But you could also look at this and say, well, gee, you know, that is just some threshold. Having a threshold of 0.5 for a binary case totally makes sense, but maybe we can move it down, maybe to 0.4, or we can also choose to maybe move it up, maybe to 0.6. One way of interpreting this is that you are able to use this threshold to tell the model how picky it has to be. By setting a very high threshold, we'll be more picky and we're only going to be assigning the one label if we're really sure. And by setting it lower, well, we might be less precise, but we should catch more ones than we might otherwise. If I were to rephrase that again, hopefully you can listen to this and kind of think, hey, that threshold allows us to move the model towards a higher precision or a higher recall. By having a high threshold, we are effectively saying, hey, we care about that precision a lot. We are going to be more picky. And this will come at the cost of recall, because in the end, we should imagine that less positive classes actually do get the right label attached. Then again, we can also go for more recall by setting the threshold quite low. And herein lies an interesting experiment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking the model that I had before, but I'm going to be making a chart. On the x-axis, I'm going to put my threshold, but then I'm going to be drawing a couple of lines. One line is going to represent the precision. I will also have one for the recall. And I'm also going to be drawing the F1 score, as well as the accuracy. But maybe an interesting thought experiment before showing you the actual chart is to maybe pause the video and to think for yourself what the shape might be like over here. Here's what that final chart looks like. In the cell above over here, I've written a bit of code. You can see that I'm looping over all sorts of threshold values over here. I am making some predictions based on that threshold value. I'm making a comparison with my predict proba over here. And as I'm going over all those different thresholds, I'm logging the threshold as well as the accuracy, precision, recall, and of one score. I put all of my results in a data frame and this chart below is the chart that I mentioned before. For starters, let's just get our intuition. This green line over here, that is the recall. And when the threshold is very, very low, that basically means that we are giving lots and lots of positive labels. And it makes sense that if we give the positive label to everyone, that the recall is quite high. After all, by assigning everyone the positive label, we are sure to get everyone back that had the positive label. It comes at one cost though, and that is the cost of precision, which is this red line over here. And as the threshold goes up, you can very clearly see that the recall actually goes down and down and down, and the precision actually tends to go up. This orange line over here, that is our F1 score. 
and you can see that the F1 score is not exactly in the middle of the recall and precision. In fact, it tends to prefer to stick to the lower of the two, both on the side on the left over here, as well as on the side on the right. At first, it seems to favor the precision because the precision is the lower line, but after the precision seems to be getting higher, it starts to be closer and closer to the recall. And this is especially evident once the recall starts getting very low numbers. Then you can really see that there's a big gap over here. Now at this point, you might notice that the lines do actually seem to intersect here at the middle, which is something that you may not have expected. But before making any big conclusions, let's actually zoom in there a bit. Notice that when we zoom in, the accuracy line actually doesn't meet in the middle over here. The recall line, together with the precision and the F1 score line, those all intersect at the middle over here, but the accuracy line over here does not. And we should also observe that this point over here where lots of lines meet, that isn't necessarily the highest accuracy or the highest F1 score either. In fact, if we were to maybe zoom in a little bit closer over here, then if you squint your eyes, you should be able to see that the F1 score and the accuracy seem to be somewhat higher over here. What I hope at this point is that you're not necessarily drawing overly big conclusions, but you are maybe kind of curious, what is happening over here? Is there something noteworthy about this particular point that makes all of these lines intersect? The answer is that there's definitely a reason for it, but this might also be a great point in time to pause the video if you're curious to figure this out yourself. To help understand what is happening here, it helps to maybe write down the formula for precision and recall. As you might remember, precision is saying something about when the model makes a positive prediction. When the model makes a positive prediction, then you can either be talking about true positives or false positives. And we're eager to understand this ratio between the true positives and the true positives and false positives together. Recall, as we've mentioned before, is actually quite similar. But here we don't necessarily care about what the model is predicting, we actually care more about the actual labels. To write that down in a formula, that means that we're talking about the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives. False negatives are when the model predicts negative, but it was actually positive. Now, one way to interpret all the variables here is that technically they are a function of the threshold that we set. But I'm going to be omitting that notation for now, mainly to ask ourselves the question, when are these two fractions going to be equal? Because if you look at both fractions, they're actually very alike. There's a true positive here and a true positive there. Same over here. So to put it bluntly, if there is a threshold where both of these fractions are equal, the only way for that to happen is to have an algorithm where the false negative is equal to the false positive. And when does that happen? Well, for that, it helps to think about the confusion matrix. True negative, true positive false positive, false negative. If false negatives and false positives are equal, that means that the confusion matrix is balanced. Put differently, we are making the same kind of mistake. It's not like the model is favoring positive values over negative ones. When recall and precision are the same, the property that you get is that you have a balanced confusion matrix. And this, I think, at least, is a pretty cute result. And I also hope that by appreciating this, you also appreciate what precision and recall can actually mean. Both precision and recall kind of ignore the true negatives, but another way to look at precision and recall is to consider what's in the denominator over here, because that tells you what it actually favors. Precision really cares about false positives, where recall really cares about false negatives. As a result, the F1 score should also be equal, if recall and precision are equal to one another, surely the average between the two is also going to hit. But there's an extra little exercise that we can do to really demonstrate this point more algebraically. And to maybe drive that final exercise home, let's do a little exercise in SymPy. SymPy is a library in Python that allows you to do symbolic math. Effectively, what that means is you're able to define some variables and you're able to use these to construct systems of equations that it can actually then solve. So for example, suppose that I've got these four variables, these are all different symbols, then I can define things like accuracy and precision and recall and the F1 score 
using all of those variables. What I can then do is I can tell SymPy that there's actually a system of equations with a solution that I'm interested in. And the way to declare that is to just have lots of equations here in this solve function that are all supposed to be equal to zero. So by putting fp minus fn in here, I am basically saying that fp has to be equal to fn. So the false positives have to be equal to the false negatives. What SymPy then allows me to do is it allows me to grab expressions like this precision over here. And I can then say, hey, you know, let's do some substitutions defined by this array of solutions. And I can then also tell it to go ahead and simplify. So even if I don't bring the confusion matrix and its meaning into all this, if I were just to look at the algebra of it, and if I were to tell SymPy to go ahead and solve this, here's what the precision recall NF1 score would look like. You can do all this math manually and it would be a cool exercise, but one thing you can just very clearly see, if the false positives are equal to the false negatives, then the precision, the recall, and the F1 score are exactly the same. And I personally think this is kind of a nice result because it highlights a strong relationship between these metrics. These metrics mainly become useful when there is an imbalance in your confusion matrix. And although in the larger scheme of things this is kind of a small point, it did feel like a cute enough result to maybe spend a video on.